Okay, for this part of the reproductive systems chapter, I want to talk about the um, system as it is in women. Now, you're familiar with the morphology of this already. Um, a couple of things that are like a little bit tricky to see in 2D here, but are not so bad on the, um, the actual models we have, is particularly like the organization of these little ligaments, like your uterosacral ligament, or the round ligament. Um, there's a suspensory ligament of the ovary up here, and there's yet another ligament that's kind of going back into the slide that would, it's also holding the ovary into position. Seen from the front, we don't have like a good model of this in lab. Well, we sort of have a good model of this. You're able to see this, you know, this additional ovarian ligament holding everything in place. Um, but the thing to understand is it was both those like cord-like ligaments, as well as the broad ligament, uh, this peritoneal extension that um, holds everything in place. Now, when if you've seen photos, Im images like this before, you know that this sort of, this kind of flattened out view with like a totally straight vagina going right into the um, uterus, it's not exactly how it is. Like in life, the uterus is kind of canted forward at like about a 90 degree angle or so. Um, so this sort of exaggerates the flatness of things. So I think it's important for you to remember that they're, they're kind of what the angle relationships are here. It's not like it's a straight shot you know, in to get into the um, uterus. When we look at the histology of the uterus itself, let's just say, first of all, in gross morphology, the uterus has a fundus, just like the stomach does. There's this lumen, which is within the body of the uterus, and then the cervix, the neck of the uterus, that kind of extends into the vagina. Um, the wall of the uterus is made up of a few different layers. There is um, connective tissue on the outside, the, um, the perimetrium. Then the um, along the you know, there's, there's a muscle a muscle wall is called the myometrium, and then finally the endometrium. Now the endometrium, the lining of the um, uterine lumen, is the part that has the greatest amount of change through the uterine cycles. So it's this layer that thickens up, becomes more vascularized and glandular, and then is also shed at the time of menses. Now. Um, you'll notice that there is a lower stratum basalis and an, and an upper strung, uh, stratum functionalis of the endometrium. Those layers, um, it's the stratum basalis that will remain after menses, but the stratum functionalis is really the part that changes. So this particular view of the histology of the uterus is kind of when it's at its thickest, you know, it kind of at the peak of the um uterine cycle, when you can see these characteristic um, spiral arteries, which are not shown very well in the picture. You can see like some of the, the glands, which appears like large voids. There are a bunch of blood vessels that are present throughout, but I know the slides that we have are better for actually seeing the spiral arteries. Um, actually, while we're talking about this, one thing to understand is that despite, in addition to like these characteristic, like well-known changes that happen to the endometrium, the breast actually undergoes similar kinds of cyclic changes, um, in tandem with the, um, uterine wall. Um, a little bit about the breast. Um, we didn't have any female cats in lab this week, in this year, so we never really got to see like what the mammary gland tissue looked like on them. Um, but it's worth just worth pointing out that so the breast we know sits above the um, pectoralis major muscle. Um, most of the differences in the size and the shape of the breast is only due to the subcutaneous fat. Um, there's really no relationship, no solid relationship between the um, amount of glandular tissue um, to the size of the breast. Now, the glandular tissue, it's, they're these modified sweat glands in a way, but instead of producing kind of a more liquid eccrine sweat, like we're used to thinking about with sweat glands, um, they're producing a much thicker, um, excretion that's going to be filled not just with water, but also, um, the, you know, kind of the milk, no, I don't know how to put it. It's going to be filled with not just water, but also fatty substances that are going to be providing energy as well as, um, hormones, as well as, um, 
you know, um, immune factors like antibodies that are going to also head out to the, um, the, the infant when they're um, nursing. One of the things, but the reason why I bring it up here in the context of the cyclic changes that the uterine wall goes through is that you should understand that there's, I mean, women will often report like tenderness in the breast around the time of their, um, around the time of their menstruation for the reason that the, before the end of a woman's first pregnancy, the glandular, the glandular tissue inside the breast are not fully matured yet. Okay, so they still undergo these cyclic changes um, in just along like with the endometrium. Um, but when you get toward when a woman gets toward the end of the first pregnancy, within about say two to three weeks of the end of the first pregnancy, when she starts um, producing milk, when her milk comes in, that's the time in which her glandular epithelium finally becomes fully matured. And after that, it stays mature. It doesn't go through any more cyclic changes. Now, well, this is, I mean, this is interesting in and of its, in its own right, but it also maps on to what we understand about some types of breast cancer. Now, we remember that breast cancer, is, or any kind of cancer, is a disease of our genes, right? There are mutations to oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes that are going to end up having a result of, they're going to result in having an increased number of cells um, get present. So, this, um, this is sort of a timeline here, shown from birth to the age of 80, um, Let's say, just to pick a number, um, if a woman were to start um, menstruating, you know, if puberty were to start at about age 12 or so, then if the, her body would start, the endometrium would start going through these cyclic changes. So these little loops here represent the kind of monthly changes that the endometrium would go through. But the thing is, if we're talking about the breast, if, if one were to become pregnant at age 24, like in the blue line, at that point, the glandular epithelium of the breast no longer go through those cyclic changes, so they basically stay static for the rest of her life. On the other hand, if a woman in the red line below, if a woman um, didn't have, um, end up having children, those epithelial cells in the breast would stay immature and would still undergo those cyclic changes for, you know, basically from the time of her puberty to the time of menopause, say around age 50 to pick a number. Um, and at which point they'd be kind of, they'd, they'd also stop doing their cycles. So a little smudge there is to represent um, part of, there's a relationship between women who have children younger and a sort of a protective effect of against breast cancer. Um, I'm not telling you to go out and get pregnant to avoid breast cancer. But what I'm saying is women who never get pregnant or women who don't have children until much later are at a higher risk of some types of pregnancy, of, of some types of breast cancer for the reason that their glandular epithelium of the breast stays immature. So it goes through more rounds of cell division than it would had they had children or had they had children younger. Um, anyway, this is just sort of a side thing that, that, that I'd like you to know about. Let's talk a little bit about how the hormonal control happens here. Again, this is a, another hypophysial pituitary gonad axis um, that's controlling the ovarian cycle. Now, the ovarian cycle, now again, I'm talking about the ovarian cycle here, not the uterine cycle. Those are related, but you'll see how they kind of map onto one another in a bit. Um, first of all, you know, so as before with, with guys, we saw that the hypothalamus makes GnRH, which then makes um, goes to the pituitary gland, which makes FSH and LH. And follicle-stimulating hormone, its target cells are what are called the granulosa cells, which would be homologous to the um, sustentacular cells of the, um, of the testis, uh, of the um, seminiferous tubule. Luteinizing hormone targets the fecal cells, which if you've been following along, you'll realize are also homologous to the interstitial cells in the testis. And we know those do different things. So the granulosa cells are those cells that are supporting the growth of the ovum. On the other hand, the fecal cells are the ones that make androgens, just like what we saw the interstitial cells do. Those androgens go to the granulosa cells, and it's at, but on the other hand, it's, the, it's those that are producing inhibin, just like what we saw the sustentacular cells doing. Those granulosa cells make inhibin, and then that feeds back on the hypothalamus to shut off the production of GnRH. Androgens um, should do that as well, but it's not really indicated on this picture. Um, another thing that the granulosa cells do with the androgens that they get is also convert them to estrogens. 
Um, just because I'm a picky person, you should know that there are actually three forms of androgen, uh, sorry, of estrogens that are present. There's um, the most potent one. When we talk about estrogen, people usually mean the hormone called estradiol, but there's also um, estrone and another one that you don't need to know. But understand that it's um, there are three forms of estrogens that are present in that are in in both men's and women's bodies. But usually when we're talking about hormone, we're talking about estrogens. Usually they're talking about oh estriol. That's the other one, estriol and estrone, um, and estradiol. Those are it's really estradiol that's the one that I think is the most potent. Anyway through the process of one of the things that those estrogens will do is they will help the follicle to mature and then eventually to, um, you know, eventually to rupture. But it has, so basically those estrogens cause the follicle to mature. And then as the estrogens go, you know, increase levels increase, it increases because the fecal cell, sorry, the granulosa cells increase in number. Um, as it goes up, you get this positive feedback where you end up pushing out what's called the LH surge, which is going to stimulate, um, uh, sorry, stimulate ovulation. Then those leftover granulosa cells are what form up into the corpus luteum that produces um, estrogens as well as progesterone, as well as the hormone inhibin to kind of shut off the production again. So this is sort of a cartoon flowchart of how it works, but consider how it looks with um, blood titer. So now we're looking at the plasma hormone concentration of follicle stimulating hormone and then luteinizing hormone. And it's kind of lined up, at least as far as the colors go and the midline, with um, the different phases of the ovarian cycle. So it, when luteinizing hormone is at a relatively low level and FSH is at a relatively low level, that corresponds to what's called the follicular phase of the ovarian cycle. So at that point, the, at that point, the follicle is increasing in size, as is the ovum that's going to be get ovulated that month. Again, as those follicular cells, the, sorry, the granulosa cells increase in number, they're going to start to ramp up their production of FSH and LH. And those two together, and also, uh, so this also maps onto it, the estrogens that are coming off are also increasing their number, increasing their concentration, which then um, causes FSH and LH to go up. So it's that surge of LH that stimulates ovulation. Now in the green phase, this is showing what we call the luteal phase of the ovarian cycle. At this point, you notice that FSH and LH are kind of tailing off, but now the corpus luteum is producing hormones of its own. So it, their levels of estrogens are still pretty high, but notice how uh, after ovulation, progesterone goes way up, okay? But then as the corpus luteum decreases in size and becomes, it ends up turning to a corpus albicans, those hormone levels kind of drop off. When those hormone levels drop off, that corresponds to this period of time of relatively low concentrations of FSH and LH. Um, when we do this in class, I might kind of stack this as a tall figure because I think it sort of helps to see everything all together. Um, just by way of reminder, recall that as the um, ovarian cycle goes through its phases, those basically correspond to different things that are happening within the ovary. Then again, if there's one thing you must remember from this class, it is that the ovary doesn't revolve around, the um, follicle doesn't revolve around the ovary. It, we're looking at different phases just kind of stacked around this particular ovary. Um, here is a micrograph of, I think, a rabbit, actually. Um, where you see there are a whole mess in this germal epithelium down here, there are a whole mess of those um, per, you know, those primitive cells, primitive follicles, but um, you know, but other uh, different phases of thing of cells like these follicles that are much closer over here, much closer toward the phase of um, ovulation. The processes by which oogenesis happens, and friends, it is pronounced oogenesis, not oogenesis. Um, are kind of mirror what happens with spermatogenesis with some differences. First of all, there are these meiotic phases that of course happen um, early on, but at meiosis one, when the first cell divisions happen, the um, there's not an equal subdivision of the 
um, cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is mostly going to go to one big cell and there'll be one little like a loser cell left over called a polar body. And that's, that's basically a nuke. The, it's like the nucleus of one of the daughter cells with, um, you know, with chromosomes in it, but really nothing else. And it's actually pasted on to the other secondary oocyte, like whatever the main oocyte is going to be. Um, this polar body might, um, might end up uh, dividing or it might not. It sort of depends. Um, but anyway, at the next site, the next um, cell division, there's again this unequal division of cytoplasm. Um, but that only happens if um, fertilization happens. So anyway, the thing to understand about that, like, so in contrast to what we see with spermatogenesis, where we have four approximately equally sized but genetically different daughter cells, here we end up potentially with four daughter cells that we could account for but that's really like accounting there's really one big oocyte um, one big primary oocyte that ends up getting ovulated um, but it doesn't really but it won't undergo its final meiotic division until um, fertilization happens notice this how the meiotic events here start like before birth this is one of the things i think is actually really fascinating about how the um like the down payment toward the next generation that happens early on in your own development. Um, for women, the stem cells that are going to turn into ova um, actually are laid down about by about six weeks after one's own conception, right? So six weeks after a woman was conceived, her the any eggs that she would possibly ovulate over her entire lifetime are already there. And they number in the hundreds of thousands. But there's this period of what's called follicular atresia, where the follicles will decrease in number um, throughout development and then through childhood. By the time of pregnancy, there are a few thousand um, follicles that could potentially um, you know, go through these cycles to result in ovulation, but of whom only a few hundred will actually get used. Um, there's not a super great evolutionary argument for why it works like this. Um, and actually, the evolution of menopause is a very interesting story that we can talk about together. But um, the big thing to understand right now is that there are some similarities between o oogenesis and spermatogenesis, but um, there are differences in like the later phases just because these cells have very different functions um, between the sperm and the eggs. Anyway, just kind of going through the cycle here, recall that um, your the, if we're looking at the view of the follicle, you know, it starts off as a primordial follicle where there's like, here's the oocyte inside it with a um, basically a single layer of granulosa cells around it. And then a primary follicle where it's slightly larger, but does have still basically that single layer of granulosa cells and the ones that are right around it would be the thecal cells that are um, receiving they're kind of getting stimulated by the lh a secondary follicle we identify when there are at least two layers of cells so by the time we see two cell layers we'll call it a secondary follicle it continues to increase in size later on it will start to develop like a little void here that's filled with this fluid that we call the liquor folliculi and then by the, and that, that fluid little void continues to expand when you get into your like mature or vesicular follicle. So at the time of ovulation, um, you know, basically that's the fluid that helps to kind of push the, um, push the, the uh, oocyte out. Um, this picture is kind of unhelpful, the photograph is anyway, for what ovulation looks like. But check this out. This is actually the first photograph of human ovulation. So to give yourself, um, this is a surgical, so this is like a, for, a small forceps that's here. So here's the ovary. Um, the ovary is you know, relatively small, smaller than the testis a little bit. Um, and this is what a mature follicle looks like. See, it doesn't like, you know, in a gentle way, sort of like look like it's just a part of the ovarian wall. You know, it looks it, it, it's much more translucent and really sticks off the side. And you see the egg here um, getting ovulated with some of those like brighter yellow thecal cell um, granulosa cells that are around it. So this is what ovulation actually looks like. Um, some women report at the time of ovulation, this sort of a pain, like a little twinge that comes off when that happens. Um, it's, a, it's a German word called Mittelschmerz that some women feel. Um, but because many women ovulate at night, not everybody notices it. 
Anyway, kind of a side story, but um, actually I was really excited when I first saw that picture because it's really super interesting and I've never seen a picture of it before a couple of years ago because it didn't exist. Anyway, um, what's left over, the leftover husk of those full of those granulosa cells um, are end up with turning into the corpus luteum that starts to produce the estrogens and progesterone. So when we, so if I go back to this slide, remember it's these estrogens that are coming from granulosa cells because, you know, they're getting stimulated by FSH and LH, primarily FSH. But it isn't until after ovulation that we start seeing progesterone come out from the um, corpus luteum. So now these are hormones, right? These are hormones that not just feed back on the hypothalamus, but they also send commands downstream. So here it is, I kind of compressed these phases together and kind of chunked it on top of the what's happening with the functional layer of the endometrium. So during the follicular phase of the ovarian cycle this is what we call the the proliferative phase of the uterine cycle so the uterine cycle in the presence of estrogens will cause the functional layer to get thickened up then after ovulation the pro high progesterone and still high estradiol um, and, and other estrogens will cause the increased vascularity as well vascularization as well as the increased glandular uh, gland production of the um, functional layer of the endometrium. So as long as progesterones and progesterone and estrogen stay high, then the uterine lining will stay thickened up. This we'll see later is actually part of the job of the placenta is to keep the placenta that will keep this nice thick uterine wall there is because it makes its own estrogens and progesterone. Anyway, when, as the amount of estrogens and progesterone that's coming from the corpus luteum goes down as it dies off, that's when those layers start, that's when the functional layer starts getting shed. So the menstrual flow period was going to happen in this period of like low hormones. So now the trick for you to know when you learn these is that this is like a two-step process where the hypophyseal pituitary gonad axis talks to the ovary so that's fsh and lh that's commanding the changes to the follicle but then when the follicle as it's producing estrogens and then later estrogens and progesterone um, those hormones I mean go through the whole body but they particularly go to the functional layer of the endometrium and if it's before you've been pregnant before it's also going to the breast right to change uh, to have, have them go through their cycles as well the um, so this is a little bit of a two-step thing and another thing that I'm kind of picky about because people are picky about it is the differences between the um, follicular like the phases of the ovarian cycle follicular luteal with ovulation in the middle as opposed to in the um, uterine cycle where it's got this menstrual phase at the beginning and like at the end but the proliferative phase that kind of lines up with the follicular phase of the uterine cycle and then the secretory phase that lines up with the luteal phase of the um uterine of the ovarian cycle so you got to know like the front end and the back the pre-ovulatory and post-ovulatory names for both of those phases um what remains for the big stuff from this chapter um, is this little thing I want to touch upon with the initial production of the uh, primary sex organs as well as the genitalia. So when I say primary sex organs, I mean testes and ovaries. Um, if we look at a really early stage, um, the like really early stage embryos, what they call the sexually indifferent phase stage, which means you get cells that can become, you know, one thing or another. So for example, so this um, gonadal ridge here is what's going to end up becoming the, um, you know, either the, uh, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be the testis or the ovary, the, um, the mesonephros and the, the paramesonephros, these two ducts together are either going to form, a, are either going to become the um, ductus deferens or they're going to become the uterine tubes. 
down here is like where your little kidney is. Also, this should remind you of the, the, the way that the testicular and ovarian arteries kind of worm their way down off the superior vena, off the um, descending aorta in the abdomen um, to be able to get down to where the gonads are because they like drag their plumbing with them. Now, this figure is kind of showing the difference between um, men have this, they're like the, on the Y chromosome, men have a gene called SRY, which stands for sex determining region on Y. Um, women don't have that. The, compared to the X chromosome, the Y chromosome is a little loser. It's only got like, you know, 92 genes on it compared to like 200 on the uh, X chromosome. But one of the things it does have that's important is SRY. So in, if we look at these, what happens with these different, from this different, you know, sexually in different phase, let's look, see what happens in the case if there's, if there's a, if there are women in the case, in the case of there are women, there's no SRY. So what happens is it's going to cause the development of the paramesonephric duct, but allow the degeneration of the mesonephric duct. So this para, paramesonephric duct is going to become the um, uterine tube. And then the ovaries are going to start their descent down. And then they end up at the time of birth with this, uh, with this kind of structure. Another thing to notice here, there's a structure here in located called the cloaca. Um, mammals don't, well, I think, I think the egg laying mammals still have a cloaca, but that's not a thing we see with like placental mammals like us. This cloaca, that's like a common, it's like, Reproductive fluids and urine and feces all go to the same, the same chamber. Um, actually, it's Latin for sewer. And what it does, basically, what, but in humans and like other placentals, it'll become differentiated so that you have like a separate bladder as opposed to, uh, and, and urethra as opposed to like the um, uterus is going to develop along with it. So this... Um, which is why there are, you know, two separate orifices for this kind of thing. And also the gut is going to have a separate pipe that comes off it. Um, anyway, so understand this is like the basic process. The main thing I want you to get from this particularly is notice it's the paramesonephric duct that ends up dying back. Now, in the case of guys, what happens is in the presence of SRY, the opposite happens where the mesonephric duct increases in size, but the paramesonephric duct dies away. And then though this kind of, there's a sort of continued descent of the, of the testes that happens lower down than the ovaries do. Um, but in all, but some of the, all of these other ducts that we see are going to be homologous with one another. Actually, all right, this is like super sexist, but this is going to help you remember. So, you know, I don't like eponyms. I don't like sexism. I don't like eponyms. So I'm going to tell you this anyway. There are the way the me the meme the way that I remembered for how to do how to do remember which is which is so the Wolfian duct is what turns into the ductus deferens, but the Mullerian duct is the one that turns into the uterine tube. So you remember that guys are wolves and women are mules. So if that's the way to help to help to go, and things I wish that at least the Mullerian duct was the one that started with M, but it's not. So whatever mnemonic, if you can find a less sexist one than that to do it, then I encourage you to do so. Um, anyway, so the testes kind of work their way down like this, but it's sort of an interesting process. Again, remember like the spermatic cord where it's like this layer upon layer upon layer of everything? That's how, what this process is. So as you look at the, you, know, you can kind of work your way through this um, image in the textbook, but the... Um, Basically, the inguinal canal here is like the last part of the body wall to um, to to get sewn up. You see, down again, closed off there. This thing called the vaginal process. You know, vi you know, the word vaginal just refers to like some kind of a like a pit that's dug. Um, so that tunica vaginalis that goes around the testis as well as the rest of the spermatic cord. That's kind of um, that basically travels along with it. Um, like I said, it's sort of as an extension of the peritoneum. Um, also because this is the last part of the abdominal wall to sew up, that's one of the things that makes, um, inguinal hernias common for guys, but like not a thing that women get really is if you're trying to strain too much to say lift something, it can cause like the intrusion of part of the, um, intestine through the, um, 
you know, you know through that opening in, in the inguinal, inguinal canal and actually will shoot part of the you know start of the intestines like down into the area where the scrotum is i mean as you expect it's painful um, which is why that um, men will tend to either live with like a rolling hernia or they will um, have, seek surgery to get it repaired. Um, another really interesting thing about this process isn't just the, you know, the different, the different uh, futures of the two ducts here, but also in what happens with the genitalia. So at the indifferent stage, there's this genital, genital tubercle, which is going to be sensory nerve rich, the uh, labioscrotal um, swelling here, and then the two urethral fold, uh, sorry, urethral folds on either side, and then the, um, then the labioscrotal uh, swellings on the other side. And if we compare how this you know, this looks between um, boys on the left and girls on the right, um, you can see we have homologous structures for you know, for the where the glands are of both the clitoris as well as the penis. Um, and notice that the, you know, the labia majora, those um, kind of mounded um, parts of the vulva that are covered with skin, they're homologous with the scrotum in this case. There's like this seam called a raphe between the, um, between the, in the middle of the scrotum as well as on the underside of the penis. Um, that's homologous with these labioscrotal swellings that in um, mature women become the labia minora. And similarly, there's a, the glands of the clitoris, like I said before, is going to be nerve rich um, and actually with a higher density of nerves than the glands of the penis. Um, but one of the things that I think is sort of interesting about this is remember that the I'm going back in my slides for a second here. If you recall what the um, penis looks like, there are these two crora and like a bulb that go out to um, support it. When we think of that in terms of the erectile tissue, but if you look at how the erectile tissue um, looks within, it looks in women, you'll see that there is still a body of erectile tissue that comes under that comes off the bottom of the clitoris and these are homologous with the two crura of the um, of the penis the um, there's not there's not really a good homolog for the bulb because it's kind of surrounded by the urethra um, in guys um, this I don't have a great uh, great slide of this but I think there is one in the um, in the uh, textbook so you can see that there are these two little paired um you know, paired roots of the um of the clitoris that end up extending to attach to the um you know to the pelvis as well anyway um we don't get to do a whole lot of comparative biology in this class just because we only look at one species but i always think it's interesting to sort of consider how the genitalia will differ you know, between the two sexes um, in normal circumstances, largely because of the hormonal environment that they develop in. That's what I have. I'll see you guys in class.